Welcome to the Elevating Life Success Strategies for Programming and Instruction. Great, and I'm just going to kick things off. I'm Diane Stairfenner. I'm president of Support Ed, and that's my Twitter handle. Um, we're based in Fairfax, Virginia, in the Washington, D.C. region. And um, I'm just really happy to welcome my colleague, Shannon Smith, and my other colleague, Dr. Carol Salva, today to really share what we've um what we've all learned and what some strategies with you about serving us life students. And I'm Shannon Smith. I'm one of the multilingual learner coaches with Support Ed. And as Diane said, it's just so exciting to be able to share some strategies uh, about programming with everybody. And I am Dr. Carol Salva. I work for Seidlitz Education, and we are extremely honored to be partnering with Support Ed. We are huge fans. We want to just welcome you again, and thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy day to join us for an hour of collaboration and collegiality and sharing some great tips today. So uh, we've got a jam-packed schedule. Uh, we're going to touch three different objectives of exploring effective programming for SLIFE, then shifting to discussing effective instruction for SLIFE before giving you an opportunity to set a goal for effective instruction and pro programming for SLIFE in your context. Uh, and my colleague Jasmine is going to share uh, a link with you because I do want to see somebody asking about uh, the slide deck. Uh, we do have a Padlet today for the webinar, um, which has the slide deck on it so that you can follow along. Also has tons of resources that we're sharing today. Um, at the end of this, session, oh, yes, go ahead. Go right ahead. You were probably going to say the same thing. We will be sharing a recording of the session in a few days. Thank you. I was not going to say that, but I appreciate you reminding me that I was supposed to say that. Um, along with the, the recording, we are going to uh, give away a few books today uh, at the end of the session. Um, we'll be giving away a culturally, re cult ooh, culturally responsive teaching for multilingual learners. Uh, book and also a copy of Boosting Achievement. So if you would like to enter to win one of those books, please make sure that you either scan the QR code. Jasmine just put in a link uh, to click on to fill out the form and we'll announce that webinar at the end of the session. I know you all gave us your names and where you're from, but if you could tell us your role and maybe why you chose to attend this webinar or what you're hoping to learn, uh, it helps us to kind of make connections uh, amongst each other today. And as you're all putting that in there, um, I'm going to keep us moving a little bit because uh, I know we have a lot to go through. So we're going to start off with research-based programming for SLIFE. And through our work at Support Ed, we've really focused um, on five major areas of SLIFE programming considerations uh, that you see on the screen. And we're going to explore those a little bit today. Um, but to start off with, um, I know you're chatting feverishly, but I'm going to also give you a little bit of a poll to see um, just in your context, what do you find most challenging when developing programming for SLIFE? I'm gonna launch that for you. Can everybody see it on their screen? Awesome. And it seems like we've got a lot of people in a lot of different roles visiting with us today, which is fantastic. And I'm seeing those votes coming in. It's always interesting to see what people find the most challenging. Again, give us a couple more seconds. Looks like we're slowing down a little bit. And give you about 10 more seconds. So if you haven't voted yet,
on my end, I'm seeing a winner. I know. Winner pop up. I'm going to share these with all of you. Can everybody see those results? Awesome. So, you know, the top uh, considerations that you find the most challenging are those program models, the staffing and resources, and effective uh, instructional approaches. Um, and one of the things that, you know, as Support Ed has been working recently with districts in Maine and Massachusetts on these programming considerations through some consultations. Districts are looking for answers in every of those categories. They're asking questions like, what's the best programming model for SLIFE in our district? Or what resources can we use to help develop content, language, and literacy using people and materials? Um, what are the best instructional strategies for SLIFE? How can we track SLIFE progress? You know, we know there's life, but how do we know how they're doing? Or how can we better support uh, and engage SLIFE families? And just like what you all shared, their top challenges were program models, staffing and resources, and instructional approaches. So we're all in the same boat together. And as we explore some of these programming strategies and tools today, I hope we find something that you can take back to your context. So, boom, we went a little too fast. And so uh, with looking at some research-based program models, um, the first one that always jumps out is that new, newcomer program, that self-contained model where our SLIFE are there for the full day or the half day. We're really hoping that they gain that accelerated language learning. But we also know that's not the only program model out there. And it really depends on what your context is, on whether or not you can have a full day program or not. Um, so other models that, that you could utilize are uh, that standalone model where students are spending most of their day in mainstream classes and then pulled out for targeted instruction. And especially for SLIFE, they're pulled out for targeted literacy support oftentimes, um, along with English language development. Um, and then we have that integrated ELD model where our SLIFE and other newcomers are in mainstream classes with that ELD support. Those ELD teachers are co-teaching or pushing in for additional small groups, um, but there's a lot of integration of content and language instruction. Um, and finally, sometimes things that we don't think about within our day is those extended learning opportunities where we, you know, you might have an extended day model where students can get some additional learning that after school or Saturday school uh, programming where students, our slave students are getting that extra focus on lang language, literacy, and content. But again, these program models, they're they're each a different model, but you can take bits and pieces of them of what works within your context. Um, so as you're chatting away, because I still see it, you all blowing up where you're from and why you're here, share. feel free to share what SLIFE programming looks like in your district. Um, because we know SLIFE program is different um, everywhere. And even share what what challenges you might have. Maybe it's, you know, you're sharing, we have a newcomer program, but, um, or we've been having this standalone model, but we're trying to figure out how to do this. Share that with us. I'm just giving a moment. I feel like I'm yammering along. That newcomer integrated ELD sheltered instruction. So it's a lot of, again, a mishmash. And that's perfectly fine. I think it's just finding that model that works best for you. And Christina, I saw, I think it was Christina said non-existent. So hopefully this gives you some yeah, ideas to take back to your up. district. You ready? We'll put it on there. We so along with, you know, looking at those program models, you know, we have to be able to think about how we're supporting that with staffing and resources. Um, and right away, I think about, you know, those staffing, those human resources, how are we able to best serve the needs of our, our students? Here. And it starts with that program model. And, you know, you're looking at how many SLIFE you have, uh, the number of trained staff, and that ideal model you'd like to have to be able to build off of. And from there, you're really looking at building those focused academic opportunities for your SLIFE. Um, and the most important part in my mind is those opportunities to collaborate 
between that collaboration between ELD and content teachers, um, because that's going to make uh, all of that scheduling, staffing, and that program model effective. So, and I know a lot of you are looking for resources, and we know there's never going to be a resource that's perfect out there. But we do have a tool that we have linked on our Padlet um, that helps really analyze some of our and evaluate your materials that you're using for Slide. The first checklist, which you see the screen, that portion of the screenshot here, uh, helps you review the materials to be able to select something that's the best. Um, we wanna make sure that it's connecting content learning and skill building, it's age appropriate. Um, as we know, sometimes what the skills are, it's not necessarily at the age appropriate level for our students. Uh, and we wanna validate that prior knowledge and experience that our SLIFE are coming with. Um, Another checklist that's included in this tool is to help you with reviewing materials to adapt them. Because again, not every program, not every resource is going to be perfect. So we're gonna have to make those adapt adaptations. And this helps you walk through some of those ideas of, you know, is it immediately relevant? Do I need to make adjustments to build on the experience and knowledge of my SLIFE? Do I have to scaffold the readability and language? So those are some great tools that you can, uh, tool you can take back and utilize as you're collaborating between ELD teachers and content teachers. Um, the third aspect that we are talking about in terms of program is effective instructional approaches. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that today because Carol's gonna spend a lot of time on that a little bit later. But these five areas of effective instruction for SLIFE, they come from De Kapua and Marshall. And I know the stuff that, uh, Carol's gonna share later is gonna address a lot of these pieces because we know it's just good stuff. Um, and it's, it's effective for helping support your SLIFE in that instruction and helping them to build that language and literacy. I'm going a little faster than I thought. Um, so the fourth component that we have today is uh, that progress monitoring and assessments. I know it was low on the list, but I still saw some votes earlier. So I want to make sure we give it some time. Um, and I know I was just at a, a SLIFE webinar where we were talking about um, identification of SLIFE. And we see more and more definitions across the country. So we're beginning to identify and recognize the students. Um, so we want to make sure that along with identifying that, our SLIFE, um, we want to make sure they're receiving the support that they need. So once SLIFE um, are identified, we have to really determine what and how you will assess SLIFE and gather the data to monitor their progress and help them achieve their academic goals. Um, in the book, DataWise, they've really described three key questions that you can ask for as you're analyzing data. Um, and applying it in education. Um, and it's really looking at what do you see, what do you make of it, and what will you do about it? And as we think about that, it's a perfect way to look at all that formative assessment data that we collect with our, you know, on from our SLIFE uh, as, they're, as we're instructing them. And as we're looking at all those data pieces, we can really look at what do I see? Are they making progress? Are there challenges? What are we making of it? Are they ready to transition to different programming? Or do I need to slow down? Is there other instruction on foundational skills that we need to do? So those are some of the pieces that, you know, as we're going along, we're applying the same framework with our slide. And then finally, what do I do about it? Do I make the schedule changes? Are they ready to leave maybe that newcomer program for a different program model? Or do they need to stay a little bit longer and maybe need some additional supports um, that can be integrated into their current schedule? So just think about what do you do in your current context uh, to support progress monitoring for SLIFE? I know this one's a tough one because uh, I know there's a, a lot of times we, this one's the harder one to think about, but how do you use data to inform instruction and programming for SLIFE? Yeah, Shannon, would you like them to share that in the chat? Oh, yes, please share that in the chat. And thank you, Jasmine, for reminding us. 
I always find this is the hard, one of the hardest components because, you know, we think about those big tests, you know, whether it's those ELP tests, the progress monitor, you know, those interim benchmark tests, but we forget about the little assessments along the way that help guide that instruction. I feel like this is usually the long type. And it's, and it is hard to find those, uh, the rubrics and being able to really dig down to where your slice are in terms of language proficiency. And I do like hearing it called street data because it definitely is. Well, take a moment to look at all those assessment strategies because there's a lot of informal assessments that are coming in because then that's, I think, the most important key in terms of assessment. And the last, last component that we're going to talk about with uh, uh, programming is family and community engagement. Um, a lot of it, and I'm going to give a shout out to Carol and her dissertation. If you haven't read that, please take a moment to, well, it'll probably be longer than a moment, uh, but take some time to read it. Uh, it's it got some really great, uh, she did some really great work uh, with uh, researching SLIFE and how family, community, and school work together uh, to support uh, our SLIFE. Um, and based on her research, factors that positive impact life success include family that is indeed encouraging and then those students that feel that sense of obligation to be successful because of those family encouragement um even just that school taking that asset-based approach to build upon slice funds of knowledge and providing those additional academic supports and ultimately the partnerships with community organizations to help build that welcoming and supportive community um, on our Padlet, we shared five strategies um, and recommendations to foster slight family engagement. Um, and you can implement those within your school or district, uh, some of them more easily than others, but they give you some really easy applicable strategies. Um, so in the chat, um, I know you're still kind of sharing some of those uh, strategies for formative assessment, uh, but please share how you're engaging your slave families. Um, I think, and I know some of it, you know, are, it's, a, it's always tough to sit and have that integration of being able to um, leverage that wealth of knowledge that our slave and their families are coming with that isn't the traditional knowledge that we're used to in public education. And I'm seeing the bilingual uh, staff, welcoming centers, parent information nights. So feel free to check out that resource. And I wanted to share also, we have a lot of other SLIFE programming resources on our website. That's linked on our Padlet as well. So you can access those um, from the, the strategies and tools that um, we shared in this section, but then also other strategies and tools from our website. And with that, we're going to hand it off to Carol and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that she can share hers. And I can see all your happy faces this afternoon. How's that look? Are we good? Okay, let's go. Well, I'm excited. You know, a couple of people sent me a direct message when you mentioned the um, dissertation and I'm trying to reply, but I'll just tell you, they asked where my dissertation was. And it's so great that the folks at Support Ed have this Padlet that they're sharing. And I'm also sharing a Padlet that is on their Padlet. <laughs> so we've got tons of resources for you. My dissertation is on my blog. And it's also on this Padlet. So you will find it if you go to the few resources that we're giving you, those link to other resources. And you will also have my email address. Just email me. If you have any question, I'll send you a direct link to whatever you need. So um, yes, Elevating Success for SLIFE. I'm so excited to be here and in honored. Like I said, I, I had a rule that I wasn't going to do much this fall. But when 
support Ed reached out. I was not going to miss the opportunity because I'm such a huge fan of their work. And uh, we're very like-minded in how we serve the community. We are uh, consultants, all of us here, and um, we like sharing. I've learned so much from them. I hope they've taken some stuff. And so this is a huge honor. So thank you for letting me do that. I want to say that to them first for letting me be a part of this. And if you don't know me, I am... Um, a, a consultant for Seidlitz Education. We are sheltered instruction, developing academic language. Um, I work for a man named John Seidlitz, our company. He wrote Seven Steps to a Language-Rich Interactive Classroom. And I started my career in Texas, where I live and where I worked for years and where I grew up. I went to school in this district in Houston, just uh, right outside of Houston. And I was an elementary teacher. And now, like I said, I work in elementary classrooms, partnering with teachers and modeling and training on the kind of thing that we're talking about today. Uh, these are some uh, pictures from just the last week or so, because we do this online virtual training here, are my friends in Springfield, uh, Missouri, and then I'm going to be there later this week doing some follow-up work with their teachers in classrooms. But a few years ago, I was teaching high school, and we have an integrated ELD model at the high school where I was teaching. So this, I was the ESL teacher. I've seen some amazing things. Every one of those models work, every one of them. There are just pros and cons to anything. And so the work that we do with schools when I come in and do program evaluation and help in the ways that my colleagues here help is we help you leverage, all of us in here help you leverage what you're already doing and offset what the slippery slope might be of, of what we're doing. And so the, the programming at this high school is just, these are just two ESL classes and these kids are in regular classes. They go to regular school and some of them have literacy and some of them don't. And the students that are SLIFE, because it was a high SLIFE population, they've generally gone through something difficult or they would have been in school. The SLIFE acronym stands for limited or interrupted education. So we're always dealing with students that are going through difficult circum or have been um, through something difficult. And so that dissertation that you were asking about, you know, that sense of belonging, that sense of belonging, there's research I came across where it offsets some of the negative effects of post-traumatic stress. And that's um, some research that I cite because I think we sometimes overlook some of the basic but most important things that we do to help people in our communities. Most of my learning started, <laughs> even though I had been a bilingual teacher, even though I had been a bilingual teacher for years and I was working at the district level and students with interrupted or limited education, it's not new and it wasn't new to us. We're in Houston, Texas. We're close to Mexico. We've seen newcomers coming with limited education for years. But what was new to us and might be happening to you right now is that they, the ones with limited education that had gone through something traumatic started coming in big numbers. Not that we'd never had these kids before, but when they started enrolling in big numbers, it kind of throws you into default and it's hard to be thinking you're being reactive and so I would just tell you that um, I started uh, falling back on my instructional coach friends. This class right here um, was so many SLIFE students and they were from refugee camps. And I'm a big fan of using whatever native language you had. Well, nobody, none of us had the same common language. And it was hard for me when they put me in the class it was already kind of off the rails because we weren't serving them well. We had segregated them and just tried to work on phonics only. And so it, I learned a lot about just taking a breath and being vulnerable and asking colleagues for help. So colleagues came in and watched and helped me <laughs> take a breath, <laughs> take a breath and fall back on what you believe. What do you believe? What are the foundational things of 
morning. These kiddos were fighting and climbing over desks. This is the middle school group. So there's a whole thing about middle school. I lift you up, middle school teachers. <laughs> I lift you up. But there was there was this thing where they were frustrated. We had let this go months where they were so frustrated. And so it seemed hopeless. It seemed hopeless. Like, how are they ever going to learn? Because they'd been through trauma. They didn't know how to read. They didn't know basic numeracy. They were fighting with each other, all kinds of things. And it can cloud what you believe is that that is not a disability. It's a lack of opportunity. It's a lack of opportunity. And like I said, there's research on how to help kids through trauma and or, or the effects of post-traumatic stress. We Those SEL things, we can't overstate how important they are. So I'm going to go quickly through some of my top tips for content teachers that we've seen very effective since the book was written and we've learned more. Um, but I just want to let you know this Padlet, there's my dissertation on it right there and my blog and my podcast. And, diff and when I do this training, when I'm brought in to train the whole high school, even if there's only three slave kids in the high school, but everybody will benefit from this. These are the resources I use. This is what I pull from. This is the free book study and all of that. And you don't need the book for today. You don't need the book that I wrote with Anna. Um, but I just want you to know you're going to have pieces of it just from being here today. So if you do have the book and you have this page, it's where we start talking about when, when people say, what do I do? What do I do? Well, what is your role? What is your role? Because you may be like me, the ESL teacher, and you teach ESL classes. Or maybe you don't have ESL classes, but you have advisory time. Maybe you don't have that, but you have after school. Maybe you have a club. Maybe you have, you know, we can train anyone to help the, te the students with listening, speaking, reading, and writing in English when the primary focus is language acquisition. There's so many things that we can do and so many things that are being done out there. So if that's your job, your role is engaging students to listen, speak, read, and write, and acquire the English language, acquire the structures and the vocabulary of this language. But maybe you are that teacher, but you go in and support content teachers. So we have like, what is your primary focus? Okay, it's about the content, but you're there to support the teacher and support the kids with accommodations for what's being taught by the teacher. And where we're gonna focus today because both of our companies are getting most of our questions right now at this point in time, what we're hearing the loudest and the most is our content teachers. Our mainstream teachers are our general education teachers. That Not that that's the only thing that you came for, we're just going to make sure you know that like my podcast is always about the newcomer teacher. It's always about this first column and I have 119 episodes or 118 episodes for you. Um, and we're going to give you those resources. So most of what I'm going to talk about is this, if you're the content teacher, and then I'll touch on the other two and give you some things and launch you in a direction that might be helpful. Okay. I, again, I don't want to under state how important it is how these students feel how they feel all of my work when when we did the research and the research was on the slight students at high school who had missed years of education some of them came pre-literate but they did not drop out the research i did was what were the factors that helped kids persist and eventually graduate why what did we do that help them not drop out. Because remember, if they don't drop out and there's nothing wrong with them, we've seen them catch up and pass up kids born here. I mean, why wouldn't they? If they're sitting there in front of you right now, not being able to write or read, it's not because they can't. It's because they haven't had the opportunity to learn. And if they haven't, if, if now they may be at a point where they're not taking your opportunities, it still comes back to how do they feel about learning and being the two biggest things with my research were kindness and patience, kindness and patience. So if we're going to focus on being kind and patience, what are patient, what are some practical things that the content teachers can do that offer kids hope 
while we're all kind and patient and watch their, their language acquisition accelerate and their literacy accelerate because of how they feel in our learning environments. So here are some strategies. Again, I'm gonna start basic, but the goal of sheltered instruction, the goal of if you're working with any level, emergent bilingual, multilingual learner, if you're learning, the goal is to make content comprehensible or understandable, at least the gist if they're brand new, but we need to give them access to grade level content by making ourselves as and making the content as comprehensible as possible. The other part of the goal is developing their academic language. So let's let's think that we're talking with a math teacher or a science teacher or even a language arts teacher at ninth grade because I'm gonna be talking about their standards while the child is learning English, while they're gaining language, while they're gaining literacy. Can we have them with grade level standards? Of course we can. The standards are author's purpose, main idea, details, characterization. We can do that. We can give them access while they're gaining language. So if you're the content teachers, here's my first big ask. It takes no extra time. But when I started teaching high school, I started smiling less. I know that's horrible to say, but it's just a little different. Like you feel like you have to establish alpha dominance and all of this. I'm not saying that's not true. I'm saying smile at the kids that don't understand anything else. And you can smile and be firm. You can smile and tell kids to walk right outside and come back in the right way. <laughs> There's nothing, I just, sometimes that's all students understand. And Anna Mattis, my co-author and I literally wrote to practice a resting smile. I, and, and I think you need it in October. You don't need that smile, that practice in August, but by this time of the school year, it's worth reflecting. Okay. Let's move forward. I wanna ask you, you've probably done simulations like this and I have this one for you on the Padlet that you can do with your colleagues, but let's, let's, just, let's just work through it. Please put yourself in the situation of a child, high school, middle school, elementary, you're sitting in a classroom. You didn't ask to be moved to that country, but you're sitting there and you're hearing a language you don't understand or you're looking at a board and it looks like this and if you don't understand this language and the other kids are getting to work. They're all getting to work and the teacher's walking around with a sense of urgency because this is just a warm up. And they're picking up papers, the teacher's picking up papers. Will you put a word in the chat? How do you feel if you're the student? How do you feel? And you know, if you look at your colleagues, there might be 1% of us. There's always that one student that's intrinsically motivated. We get one. So you might have a colleague that says, I'm intrigued. I'm curious. Okay, you're not the majority. I understand that might be a personality thing, but look at what most people say, even educated people like us. Look, it gets dark. Look how people, students say the saddest things. Like, I honestly, I have heard, I used to be smart in my country. Okay, we are smart. You are smart. This only went on for about 30 seconds. Imagine their entire day with no, with, without, and when there are things that are comprehensible that they could be, they're not even trying, they're putting their hoodie on, they're putting their head down because maybe they've gotten, they, maybe they haven't had a win in a long time. We can do that. We can change that. How do they have hope? We should be going home going, how did I give hope today? Not, oh, did that lesson go exactly the way it was? That's what I always went home going, oh, I wish I would have done this different. That's natural. But if you feel like you are giving kids, showing them those little progress monitors, the formative assessments, look, last, when you first came, you couldn't read anything. And now you can tell me some of these words. That's progress. That's progress. That's hope. Hope is, a, it's, it's addictive. It's those little wins, you want more of them. But 
This is the opposite of that. This is what Stephen Krashen would tell you is called an affective filter going up. Your negative feelings, a filter goes up and you can't learn a lot through that filter because you're preoccupied with what you just put in the chat. Bored, overwhelmed, lost, confused. That's that's that filter not letting you even catch things. But let's pretend instead, okay? Because erase, 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 erase. Pretend like instead, every time I saw you in the hall or when you walk in the classroom, I wave and say, ha body, ha body, ha body, ha body. Every time, it's just what I say when kids walk in. But the minute I see my newcomers or any, any in bilingual students or emergent bilingual multilingual learners, I fake sign language my way through everything. Not when the lesson starts, the minute I see them. Like, what time is are you running today? Um, when is the game? What what time is that? Okay, watch me come in. It's so nice to see you. It's just charades, okay? It's just fake sign language. If I'm here picking up a book and I want the kids to get a pen, I'm showing the book. I don't have any extra minutes, but that doesn't take any extra minutes. Watch me, class. Listen, I'm going to read first. And I'm talking about high school, all of grade levels. So here's the thing. I walk over to my visual and I point, I tap and talk. I tap and talk. Yes, Melissa, we're talking about comprehensible input. Do you know how many times you say the parts of the plant when you're teaching it? A lot. The repetition is already there. It's already there because we say our vocabulary all the time. Am I remembering to tap and talk? Am I remembering to point? Because that's the biggest ask of the students. Our newcomer students ask if there's anything that the content teachers can do for us right now is visuals and gestures. If you're talking about the solar system, just gesture toward the poster of the solar system so that the student isn't, what did you put in the chat? Lost, overwhelmed, confused, nervous, right? You have the gist, at least you know we're talking about the solar system. And let's remember that this is not a disability. Every single day, you would understand more. You would learn Swahili without even trying because language is best caught, not taught. We can teach you actually a lot of language once you have some under your belt. It's, it's much easier to go back and teach the phonetics and everything once you start catching some vocabulary, but how easy it would be to catch the vocabulary. I promise you, I promise you by next week when I say habadi, you'd say it under your breath, habadi. You got that. I'd be like, look at your Swahili coming along. But it's not that you tried it. It's that's how language works. Low affective filter. Stephen Krashen says that language is, comes fastest when you forget you're learning a language. So I want to make myself, look, look, this is what, if you're watching my screen, I mean, me, solids, liquids, gases, watch me, like just fake sign language. Students would catch more. And do you know how many times you say it? You say it so much, but what I need my instructional coach to help me with is to remember to do it. Once you remember to do it enough, ESL folks will tell you, you can't not do it. It becomes a habit that you can't not do. Tapping the words, tapping the words when you say them. You can't, and we want teachers to be in that spot. What are the most powerful things that content teachers will do because it'll help the whole class? That is, that is a place we wanna be. And not just good for all kids. I want them to know a little more relevance than that. So like I said, the, this, is in, this is in the Padlet with and without comprehensible input. How do you feel? That's all I need as a teacher throughout the year to remember to point and tap and talk. And you can do that takes two minutes of a faculty meeting. And I didn't speak any Swahili, so you can do this. I just don't want those things you guys said in the chat 
It's okay. I want to use Google Translate and make sure the student knows you'll be fine. But watch me. And every day you'll understand a little more English. Now with my colleagues, I'm going to ask them, or if you're that content teacher, I'm going to ask you to be kind and patient because students understand more than they can say a lot of times. And that silent period might go on for a while because they're nervous to use the English they're starting to acquire. And those domains are separate. So they might understand a lot more, but they're not going to say, I understand more. Give me more. Just assume that they are understanding a little more every day. Many of us have worked with newcomers and you can look back at the newcomers last year and go, ah, they do know more English. Of course they do. So know that process is happening. We want them just not freaked out, curious if possible. Like some of y'all started putting in the chat, I see commas, you know, cause you can attend so that at some point in the year, they're just happy to, and they know they should be there and they're catching more and more every day. So what have we talked about? Welcoming tone. Make sure you're sending the message. You don't have to speak the same language for kids to know you want them there. 65% of communication isn't even verbal. It's nonverbal. Gestures like charades, just play fight, fake sign language all day. <laughs> it's not taking any extra time and it's super helpful. Visuals, you know, this post-it paper was the only thing I asked for because I wanted to co-create text text with students and your walls are your co-teacher. Your walls are your best co-teacher. So what's on the walls that all kids can access and you can gesture towards or point towards or stand near when you're teaching. And I do, I am going to talk a little bit about letting them use their heritage language. Please, if we're talking to content, math, science, social studies, language arts standards, how would you do it right now in Swahili if I made you only learn in Swahili? Maybe you'd be fine if, you're, if you speak Swahili. But I want you using all of your language, but I promise you I'm okay with that because I promise you I'm going to get a lot of language out of your mouth in the target language of English. If that's your target language, English, I'll get a lot of English out of everybody's mouth today, I promise. Here's how. What we want to focus on is making sure that our content classes have opportunities for all students to use the academic language. And it goes beyond this is good for all kids. We need to stop saying that. <laughs> we need to tell them that Marzano tells us that properly supported structured conversations lead to a 19 point percentile gain in achievement on standardized tests. It's not that it's all about tests. It's that we need to show relevancy from all different directions for what we're asking. And it is a measure of learning when you look at standardized tests. So this is beyond it's good for the other kids. What I'm asking you to do is set up a low stress academic conversation at least once per lesson because, because it's good for everybody's, beyond good for everybody's learning. It's tier one instruction, and it's what boosts achievement of the entire class. I love this quote by Samantha Bennett. The person doing the speaking is the person doing the thinking. The person doing the thinking is the one doing the learning. So I used to think I had to do all the speaking because I'm the only one in my newcomer class that speaks English. Well, after about six minutes, they're tuned out anyway. I need to allow them to use all their language. But if you have a language target in English, a little language goal in English, I know I'm moving English every day. So how does that make sense for math, science, social studies teachers? Remember, we're gonna ask them to be kind and patient and do a few simple things that will raise your test scores for the whole class. Things that are, things that are not hard to do and understand that you don't, translating is fine, but you don't need to translate everything. At the beginning, maybe you think you need to, maybe you should to make the kid feel good, but their buddy who speaks their language and you using Google Translate, let us not think that we need to do that all year long. We do not. If I am using comprehensible input, every day they understand more. So I'm going to get to where it's just keywords and phrases, but watch me. If you watch me, you should be getting more. So as the year goes on, 
less translating, more comprehensible input. Remember, comprehensible input is half the equation. Developing academic language, low stress opportunities to speak. These kids do not speak the same heritage language, but it's okay because we have a sentence starter. They all started in English and then they use whatever language they had and they switched to another partner and they switched to another partner. One of those partners is going to be good for that <laughs> person, but it's just offering so much when we have collaborative learning and structured conversations. So to develop language, create a culture of conversation where it's controlled, it's structured. They're gonna talk at least once in math and imagine the effect for this life student that gets to be there every day. You have sentence starters, not just for the English learners because they direct thinking for all students and give all students academic an academic register. And Carol. Yes. Just to keep us on time, we're loving the strategies. We have just four more couple, minutes. Couple, yeah, just a few minutes. So. Yes, I know. That's I'm looking at my question. clock. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, awesome. Okay. Yes, yes. Thank you for doing that because I asked you to let me know if I was going long. So here's where I'm going to start wrapping up for content teachers and just tell you a few folks to follow for the newcomer classroom. One sentence a day. I want my I want my colleagues to know that the the effect of that would be almost 200 more opportunities to repeat and throughout the year, it becomes more than just repeating. Remember, you can take an exit ticket and turn it into a language target with one sentence. And that's what I'm asking for, just one sentence and I'll help, we'll think through what that sentence should be. Our company is um, kind of famous for practical things. So this structure, Sure, I'm, I know a lot of you know QSSA. Put in the chat if you know QSSA, because my boss came up with this routine and Anna and I cite it. And I'm just giving you a lot of resources, but this is how we actually have kids talking. They will talk at all different grade levels if it's structured the right way. So this offers wait time and language and which partner and accountability. It's, it's a great routine, I promise. So if you are the newcomer teacher, here are the folks. Um, this is really what it should look like, right? It should look like kids working together through things that we all wrote together because there's something in this for everybody, but they're the authors, the class, they're the authors. So that co-constructing text is my top tip. And I definitely have, you can find so much on how to co-create text with students, but make sure they understand the fluency is important. Look at some people I would tell you to follow, Amanda McLaughlin in Omaha Public Schools. You see her alphabet? Let's not think these kids don't have the background for our phonetics very quickly, depending on what we use for an alphabet, right? I was using the wrong alphabet. Kimberly Thyberg is a fantastic high school SLIFE teacher to follow on Twitter because she uses my book and she said she shows what the kids are doing every day. Her SLIFE students, how she's co-creating text. She's using something from Emily Francis here, which is another great follow. But we want the students self-directing their learning. And again, the walls become the co-teachers. And I didn't even have walls. That was somebody else's classroom I had to use. There's a great Facebook page. This is the one I would join about SLIFE. And people like Marissa Fernbau there is showing her kids in the first week of school are absolutely talking to each other the way that we're setting it up. If you are going in and supporting the content teachers, Emily Francis is my top tip. If you follow Emily Francis, she was Slife. She is now an author and a keynote speaker, but she she has her own newcomer class in high school, but she also goes in and supports content teachers and shares all about it on Facebook and Twitter. And she's amazing. So I'm going to wrap up there, but I want to let you know that you have podcasts like this with videos because I've been doing this for years, sharing what I learn. So whether it's about literacy and what's practical in your newcomer class or going beyond just doing that or using that kind of thing in a mainstream classroom, how can that even make sense? Or maybe you're helping a teacher that just has one newcomer. There's so many shows and you have access to all of them. Here are just a couple of things coming up. We have a literacy conference that's starting tomorrow night. Take a quick picture of this. Sidelitz Education has uh, Tuesdays in October. 
one registration fee for all of these. And they're just an hour and 15 minutes each. And I'll be sharing on SLIFE and my colleagues are sharing about other literacy for emergent bilinguals. And the Unite to Achieve SLIFE Summit is the last thing I'm gonna tell you about because it's happening in November and it's an entire summit on supporting students with limited education in liar learning is putting on a fantastic thing in two different cities and online. So come join us for that too. All right, I am done and I want to thank you and let you know you have so many resources here um, and just reach out to me if I can help you with any of them. Thanks so much, Carol. We love hearing from you. Um, so we're gonna take a few minutes if you have any questions. Um, we're going to wrap up and reflect. And I think we can skip ahead, Shannon, to the questions part. If you all have questions, you can ask them in the chat. We'll take you know, a couple few minutes. And um, if you have questions about programming and questions about instruction or anything else, just go ahead and ask them. And I'm just going to kind of... Can I shout out to Tim McHugh, who is in the chat? He it has Saddleback Resources, and those were my favorite books. They're Hilo readers of Saddleback. We did a lot of reading together, but then we would just, if we could get a hold of those books, those were fantastic. Yeah, we we utilized those when I was in Lancaster, too. Oh, um, and, Saddleback. And I... One of the things that I noticed when I was reading through the chat, uh, when I had that moment while you started to present, Carol, uh, that some of that programming piece comes up of, you know, you might have, it, coming back to that, you might have that newcomer program, but then they, it's like that giant leap when they transition to that next programming piece for them. And I just know from, I was an administrator, an EL administrator in Lancaster, Pennsylvania and in our work with Massachusetts and uh, in Maine, that's a lot of the conversation of just the struggle of being able to find the right programming and to support students, exactly like what you were sharing of, you know, being able to transition from that newcomer program, if you do have one, into that standalone program or that integrated model and how to do that. And I think some of those strategies you shared were excellent in, in being able to kind of connect. It's not just about the programming. It's, it's you know, what program modeling you have. It's also about that effective instructional strategies and pulling in materials like Saddleback materials so that you're still doing it. You know, you're still talking about the same content standards. The readability is just there. Um, and so those are some things that kind of popped out for me as I was kind of looking through uh, some of those pieces. Thank you. I know our work aligns so much. I appreciate that. Folks in the chat are asking where they can get a hold of me and all of my links. I mean, all of ways to get a hold of all of us are on the Padlet, the uh, support ed Padlet that keeps being shared. Um, it, all, all of the resources are there. You can Google me, Carol Salva, and you probably find me too. And I'm on Twitter and I'm on Facebook. And so are these guys, follow support ed. Was there a question before we wrap up so that yeah. there's I'm a question that's in a couple of questions one and I'm going to ping this over to Shannon and then there's some instructional questions too about a numeracy screening tool for a high school's life um I, do you want to share a little bit about yes yeah, yeah, we've been working. I know that we do have some intake uh, tools um, on the support ed website in the SLIFE uh, page, but one of the, the pieces that we've been working a lot with Maine right now on is developing a numeracy and literacy screener in students. Um, home languages, right? Yeah, their home languages or their, their predominant language because um, We've been seeing that as a great need. A lot of the states, and I've sat in on Orly's uh, sessions this summer with this with SLIFE, and that's been one of the biggest pieces. There's a lot of uh, SLIFE definitions that bring that up, but then there isn't the screener. And I think that's the next piece is being able to find some of those tools out there. Um, and hopefully we can expand those out in the future, Diane. 
Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Thanks, Shannon. And there's a question, um, Carol, any advice you can give to ESOL teachers that have SLIFE students, but are in several school locations and can't be there daily? So what do you have any tips for those itinerant teachers? Um, so the question is, when teachers can't be there daily, mm -hmm. what is the biggest bang for the buck? So I would go back to, okay, what are you supposed to be doing? Because if you are teaching math as an ESOL teacher, that's not really what our job is supposed to be. Our job is supposed to be offering linguistic accommodations to the math teacher and supporting the students in that way and developing academic language. So the second year that I did this, when I when when we started getting good at it, they put me in high school and I only got to see the kids every other day. But those kids went faster because I knew what I was doing. We focused on some of the things for literacy, but we partnered with the students to understand fluency. The idea of fluency is rereading and rereading and saying again, like if you wanted to get a sentence to go on vacation because you're going to Italy, you would do it again and again and again. And if you saw the text, you would sit there with your sentence and do it again and again to become more fluent at that. I want them to understand it's going to go faster the more you practice it. So I'm not, I don't want them to struggle when I'm not around to try to get through things that they can't understand. I want them to reread things they've already understand to become more fluent. So it's more about teaching older students what to do, up third grade and above, what to do when you're not around. It's not how many minutes I have with them. It's always about inspiring them to do easy things and more of it when you're not around that are not hard, but support fluency. Hopefully that's helpful. That is very helpful. Thanks so much. Oh, somebody was saying that my links didn't work or my QR codes didn't work. So I'm putting upcoming events in the chat right now. Just click on sidelitseducation.com and click upcoming events. And um, for the SLIFE conference in November, look for the hashtag unite to achieve and you will, you will find it in mm -hmm. liar learning. And I've seen questions about the Maine and Massachusetts research. Reach out to us. You can use info at supported.com and we'll be happy to share all of our learning with you there.